Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Secret Origins Special Number 1 from 1989 and from DC Comics. This is probably one of the best mainstream comics published in 1989. You know, there was, I guess the competition wasn't that great. Speedball... Rob Liefeld, New Mutants or something. But um, it's weird how in the DC uh, universe, there'd be just these weird little titles where certain editors just had their own little fiefdom and would just do crazy stuff. And Secret Origins started um, probably in 85 around then. And somewhere around like in the 20s, I think it was, I, I think that's when Mark Wade took over. Maybe Mark Wade was always the editor, but he started getting really daring. And every issue of Secret Origins would have like three stories of three different characters, their origins. He'd just do weird things like get Trevor Von Eden, when Trevor Von Eden was kind of out of the business, lure him back to do like a Trigger Twin story, a Western. Or, you know, have an ambush bug issue and just all these weird artists he'd get. Um... Some of them from outside the mainstream world. And, uh, but this one is just like, man, it's a banger. It's like, it's uh, all of uh, Gotham's villains. And um, fucking covered by Brian Bolland right off the bat. Nice cover. Well, I mean, I don't know if Brian Bolland's ever not done a nice cover. So the first, uh, there's a framing device to this. And it's written by Neil Gaiman. <laughs> and this is a weird combo. Especially because Mike Hoffman, uh, in some of the videos I've shown off Mike Hoffman's work before, did lots of weird indie stuff. Um, not much mainstream stuff. So just the fact that they got Hoffman in pencil, this is weird for 1989 for DC. But they, it's inked by Kevin Nolan. So like two heavy hitters combining their styles. It's pretty interesting. Of course, Kevin Nolan then wasn't much of a heavy hitter. Everyone knew he was great, but he kind of would just pop up very infrequently in Marvel and DC Comics. So basically, Batman sneaks into this guy's apartment. He's like a TV producer. Kind of gives him a warning. Kind of a... <laughs> basically, like the special you're going to do. This documentary about all the my villains. You know... I, I would think twice about it. So it's kind of like Batman being kind of a fascist. <laughs> it's like, dude, man, freedom of the press. He's just afraid that he's going to make him seem sympathetic or something. This guy's pretty tough, though. He's just like, you don't scare me. Fuck off. So then we see the producer, like, with his, whatever, his workers. And they're planning this documentary. They're trying to line up people. Um, not having much luck. They really want the Joker, of course. That's the big coup, and of course, how do you find the Joker? I mean, and then again, do you want to find the Joker? Not a very wise move. But they get they have like the ex-wives of certain villains, and some people lined up. Look at this Hoffman Nolan. Pretty damn nice. Let me just flip back there. Did I miss something? <laughs> well, they're all nice panels. So it's basically them just planning this thing. And they do get this ex-henchman uh, of the Penguin. And he's going to tell us a story. And then we go into the first story. The Killing Peck. Written by Alan Grant. You know, long, long time 2000 AD contributor from England. Of course, obviously... To tons of Batman stuff for DC. But look at this. This is way before this was a thing. Sam Keith on pencils. Oh, I'm sorry. Pencils and inks. And I mean, this is way before even Sam Keith was a hot shit at Marvel. Not that long before. Way before the Max. But, you know, before the Max, a couple of years, he was getting becoming, you know, like wizard hot artist guy. So this was like a 
weird that they'd get Sam Keith in 1989 to do, a, you know, a major DC comic. And even then, he was fucking great. It was some nice stuff. So we see these, uh, these two guys driving this truck, and this owl crashes into the window and makes them crash. They were, uh, delivering some prisoners. So they, they spring this guy, this prisoner. And, uh, he's like, is that you boys? I knew you wouldn't let me. And then they put him to sleep with some like gas and it's the penguin. This guy's name is Sharky. And Sharky's just this long time thug. I love this uh, way he dressed the penguin. Just kind of like seedy. He looks like a bar fly or something. So he's got Sharky tied up, the, the penguin and his henchmen. And, uh, Penguin's got a pass with this guy. We don't quite know what it is yet. That's great, Sam Keith Hart. It's nice to see him inking his own pencils. So, it turns out this guy Sharky went to school with the Penguin when they were little kids, and he would bully Penguin incessantly. And, uh, you know, he was just a cute little kid. I love this drawing of little Penguin, how cute he looks. Happily reading his books about birds. Surrounded by all this, he's in the bird shop. And so, uh, you know, from a young age, he loved, he was fascinated by birds. And just wanted to be left alone so he could read his books. But this guy kept fucking with him, this sharky kid. So Penguin's getting his revenge after all these years. Hope you can see this art okay. <laughs> that just slays me though, I'm sorry. He's so freaking cute. So now we see the Batman talking to James Gordon. Obviously, Sam Keith loves like the rights in Batman. Look at that keep. It keeps insane. It's like 40 feet long. And then we cut back to the penguin, basically recounting to Sharky all the humiliations he endured because of him. So the penguin uh, trained himself in the martial arts. He was like, yeah, I'm a little guy, but I'm tired of getting picked on. And one day he confronts Sharky and he knocks his teeth out, or at least one of his teeth out. Now we cut back to Batman. Batman's on the trail. He's trying to find his escape prisoner. Man, I really like the way he draws Batman. I'm trying to think. I can't remember if Sam Keith. Oh, I guess he did those covers for Nightfall. Oh, wait, was that Kelly Jones? Am I thinking? Whatever. But as far as an interior Batman story, I can't remember uh, Sam Keith. I'm sure he did, and I just forgot. So he, he actually, we go back to the flashback. Penguin trounces Sharky. His martial arts training paid off. But when he returns to his bird store, Sharky, in retaliation, in revenge, killed all of his birds. Look at this panel here. That's fucking amazing. It's so good. It's just considering this is a DC comic, too, like a total mainstream, normal superhero comic. But uh, he tells Sharky, he's like, in a way, you inspired me. That just like, you know, gratuitous violence and cruelty. It, uh, it's effective. And in fact, I've been doing that my whole criminal career. I took a page out of your book. So Sharky, I didn't mention this earlier. He's got m metal teeth. That's why they call him Sharky. These sharp teeth that he uh, had implanted. And the penguin fuses them with like solder.
and then he takes him to the zoo. Batman's hot on his heels. He's followed the trail to the zoo. And the penguin throws Sharky into the tiger pit. So Batman goes to rescue him. Sorry, I gotta check real quick. These are pretty nice colors for a late 80s DC comic. I know the lettering is a... Uh... Oh no, I'm sorry. It's Tom McGraw. I remember that name. He colored a lot of stuff. Pretty nice moody coloring that kind of really matches Sam Keith's artwork. So the penguin escapes and Batman takes Sharky to the hospital. So that's the end of that story. So now we go back to, to the framing device and the next story also written by Neil Gaiman. And this is really weird that a 1989 DC comic would have this artist. Bernie Moreau, the Canadian artist who does the jam. Very idiosyncratic style, very indie style. I'm sure most kids who pick this up off the newsstands expecting a normal Batman comic were probably pissed off. <laughs> but, and this is weird too, inks by Matt Wagner. And this is even weirder, colors by Joe Matt of Peep Show fame. I know I knew Joe Matt had done some like mainstream coloring. Like he always talks about that was the most money he ever made in his life. He did that Batman Grendel miniseries. But I guess he did this one too. It says letters A B C D, which I assume is just Bernie Moreau. Cause it looks like his you know, he has his own style of lettering. And I'm pretty sure he lettered this as well. But just look at this. Bernie Moreau is not like slicking up his style. He's just drawn like he draws. And this one features the Riddler. So they go to interview this uh, TV crew, go to interview the Riddler in this weird old warehouse, which has all those giant props that Batman used to seem to f frolic on all the time in the 50s and early 60s, which I don't know if that was a thing. Was that a thing back in the 50s and 40s? Companies would make giant versions of typewriters and radios that worked. I don't know if that's just a Batman thing. I gotta say though, a little disappointed with this story. It's, um, I love the crazy art. Even Joe Matt, you know, going to town on this with this crappy paper, doing his best to do some interesting color stuff. But this is like one of my least favorite Neil Gaiman stories I think I've ever read. Cause it's basically just the Riddler spouting these questions, you know, like they're not even good riddles. It's almost like poetry. It's him being all kind of like, it's almost like pretentious, him just saying weird things. And they're like, come on, give it to us straight. Stop messing around. We just answer our questions. And he just keeps saying these odd things. Some of them are mildly interesting, but most of them aren't. He does the reminisce about the time, the more innocent time when, you know, <clears throat> the early Batman villains, it was all kind of a game. They all had their little, uh, their thugs in cute little costumes. And, but then, you know, he realizes the game has changed. At one point, I do like this writing where he just says something like, Christ, the Joker's running around killing people now. Did I miss something? When did they change the rules? So that part of this, I do like when he gets lucid. But for most of the story, he's just spouting this cryptic nonsense. Man, just really fun art. Great cartoony. You can definitely see the Matt Wagner influence. So I guess that was the concession to slick it up a little to get Matt Wagner to ink it. But it still looks very much like Bernie Moreau, his weird little style. Great panels, weird, weird backgrounds. Mm -hmm. 
And finally, after saying all this odd stuff, he just says, the audience is at an end. I thank you. And he bids them adieu. So now without the framing device, we go right into the next story. And this is about Two-Face. And I believe this is told by his ex-wife. At the very least, she figures very prominently in here. So this one's written by Mark Verheiden, kind of a forgotten guy in comics. In the 80s, mid-80s, he was a, did a lot of kind of prominent stuff for Dark Horse Comics. He, his probably uh, best-known work is The American, this patriotic superhero, uh, but from an adult angle. It was a comic from Dark Horse, but he also drew some of those Aliens versus Predator. I'm sorry, wrote some of those. So he, he had a, a lot of stuff under his belt. But I, I think he just went back into screenwriting. He was a screenwriter. So I haven't seen his comics in a long time. He was really tearing it up in the comics industry in the mid-80s to late 80s. Pat Broderick pencils this. Ten-year-old Hercules Pettick's favorite artist, or one of his favorite artists. And by the late 80s, Pat Broderick was pretty bad. But they got Dick Giordano to ink it. So as far as late 80s, mid to late 80s, this is some of the nicest Pat Broderick work I, I've seen. You know, just very pedestrian, but it's not bad. You can tell how much is Dick Giordano, like this feathering. Dick Giordano is obviously cleaning it up pretty nicely. So uh, we're back on this like TV TV show, and they're talking to Two Face's wife, and we have this other character. This uh, let me see if I can find his name. It'll probably come up soon. Oh, I'm sorry, Dalton F Perry. Dalton Perry was put away by Harvey Dent. Harvey Dent is uh, Two Face's alter ego. That's who he was before he became Two-Face. He was a district attorney. A really good guy. Heroic. And this guy, Dalton Perry, is just like a strangely intense man. He, uh, he basically says, put me in solitary confinement. I don't want to talk to anyone this whole time. I'm locked up. They're like, no. You know, no special favors for you. So he just says, okay. And apparently... He talks his cellmate into committing suicide. This guy, they, the next morning, this guy's hung, and some of the prisoners could hear him whispering to him all night, like basically somehow convincing him. So it's not like he has a mutant superpower or anything. He's just this really creepy, imposing guy. So he spends his whole prison time in solitary, apparently just so he can think about how he's going to get revenge on Harvey Dent. That's how intense this guy is. So he actually gets out of jail and uh, buys a gun. Just total uh, one thought in his head. He goes to Harvey Dent's house and finds the wife there. And he says, I'm going to kill your husband. And then we see more flashbacks to how Harvey Dent became... Two-Face, some guy threw acid on his face during a trial. And then his mind snapped. And instead of loving the law and the order it brings to society, he realized everything's dumb, stupid chance. And that's when he starts getting that coin and flipping it. Whichever way the coin turns up, either the, the scarred side or the unscarred side, he goes by its judgment. So this uh, Dalton Perry guy has got his wife tied, uh, Harvey Dent's wife tied up, Two Face, and he kind of puts the announcement out, lets everyone know, and Two Face actually is concerned, like he's left his wife years ago and became evil. But when he hears the news, he's like, I got to check this out. You know, he's still got some vestigial love for his wife. 
buried deep inside his monstrous brain. In fact, he actually sits outside the house for hours just thinking about it, flipping his coin. He doesn't run right in there and rescue her. He actually was just like, I don't even, I love her, I hate her, I don't even know what I'm going to do. More flashbacks to how he becomes Batman's, you know, one of his main villains. This is a panel I would have fucking cut up and put on my wall when I was 12. Just like fun superhero art. So Two-Face obviously flipped the coin a certain way and he jumps in, dives through the window. And uh, they fight. The house is uh, on fire. And Two-Face gets the better of him. And he's going to kill him, obviously. But his wife says, Harvey, no. So it kind of reaches him. And he's like, all right. So he rescues the guy. Of course, he rescues his wife from the fire, but he even drags the guy into the fire because he knows that his wife doesn't want to, to murder this guy. And the wife still loves him. She says, come back to me. Oh yeah, here's where he says it. I love you. I hate you. Kiss me. I mean, he's psychotic. Sorry about this. The pages are getting sticky. But, you know, she still has this fondness for Harvey. She's like, he came back for me. She'll never forget that, that Harvey was there for her. I know he'll come back. And we see Harvey kind of watching her. Pretty good uh, character piece. Then we see more of the TV show. They do a talking head se segment, a man on the street segment. Look at all these great, well-drawn, interesting faces. And we see a familiar character here. Look, it's John Constantine. I just love this page. Just all these great faces. <laughs> Stereotype punk cracker guy. Really nice stuff. So the, the main guy, the TV guy, is talking to the camera and um, kind of wrapping it up. And this character walks behind him with a cloak and a long hat. It's a purple coat, I should mention. And we see kind of something, almost like something wafting from him. And the guy's, as he's saying goodnight to the TV, television audience, he starts laughing, he starts tittering. Giggling, and it gets louder and louder. And it was the Joker. The Joker didn't want to be on the show, but he didn't like the fact that this guy was prying into whatever. Trying to pry into his past. So he wants to take him out, and he does. It's pretty creepy. And that's it. Um, I don't know if this is in hot, high demand now because of Neil Gaiman. This is like early Neil Gaiman. But uh, what an issue. I mean, especially considering the time, getting weird. <laughs> having Joe Matt Colors at a DC comic is weird. But having Bernie Moreau draw a story, even Sam Keith at the time, that was kind of weird. So this is just all around pretty fun comic. I probably own only like, I don't know, other than the Doug Munch, Kelly Jones run of Batman, which I love those. I have every issue. That's about 20 issues. Other than that, I probably have like, 20 issues of Batman in my whole collection. Just all the stuff that's like stand out. And uh, okay, maybe more than that. I, I'm forgetting about Dark Knight Returns. I'm forgetting about year one. But as far as weird oddball issues like this, random stuff, 
I don't have many, but man, this is a keeper. And I hope you can find a copy for yourself. I hope you already have one. And I hope you enjoyed it. Because it was really fun looking through this again. I don't think I've cracked this comic open since like the 90s, early 90s. But that's it for this uh, episode. And I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.